Chapter One Jasmine was alone in the compartment, enjoying the first sight of Venice. Chapter One Jasmine was alone in the compartment, enjoying the first sight of Venice. In the distance, a train was calling slowly across the long bridge that connected the Isle of Venice to the mainland of Italy. She saw bell towers and domes picked out in the deep beams of bright spotlights and reflected in the dark water of the lagoon. Only the towers and spears could be seen. The other buildings were mainly dark silhouettes, almost indistinguishable for the surrounding blackness of the night. Jasmine stood up and pulled down the top half of the train window. With no glass between her and the view, she could suddenly see a lot more. Only the lagoon refused to give up any more of its secrets. The water was so dark that anything could be hiding down there, and she wouldn't know. The interior of the carriage was still warm from the heat of the day. The wind on her face was cold. The train was inching toward the city, and Jasmine felt a shiver run down her spine. She saw more and more of it. There were street lights, one, each one illuminating a little more than a small patch of a wall all the way floor, but they were lights of oncoming platforms, station platforms. But beyond that, there were only silhouettes of buildings against a starry sky. Less than twenty minutes later, Jasmine was lost among the dark masses of buildings. She had never been in a city without roads before, which is disconcerting enough. But this city seemed also to be also entirely without people. She stopped to look had a map displayed on her phone and tried to work out where she was. Only one street of four seemed to have a name, and none of the names she read on the side of the buildings were the same as the ones on the map. The wheels of a suitcase grumbled noisily over the cobblestones behind her as she picked a direction almost at random. A blue dot marking a position suddenly jumped three streets as the app updated her position based on her historic factors known only to itself. You lost as well, aren't you? she said to the small inanimate device. A figure appeared at the end of the alleyway, and Jasmine drew a breath to ask for directions, but then shut her mouth again. The figure was an old man, stooped and drunken, his growling infective at himself. Jasmine didn't understand his words. He said her tongue was pretty good, but the man's words were aren't a tongue weren't Italian, it's something else, a local Venine, Venetian dialect. Jasmine guessed, but she didn't, may not have understood the dialect. The stream was clear to her, but the words the man was saying were bad words. She could. She put her head down and she ended walking, coming uncomfortably close to the man in a narrow alleyway as he stumbled past her. She breathed a little sigh of relief as she emerged into yet another small square with yet another can- canal bisecting it. It's a simple stone bridge across, leaving Jasmine no option but to climb the steps, her suitcase banging each against each step as she went up. She reached the centre of the bridge, the apex, and was suddenly confronted by a wall of noise. It was a throaty roar of hundreds of voices. It's coming from a small runway on the other side of the small square. From where she was standing, at the highest point of the bridge, you could see the alleyway was short, and there was a huge open space beyond. The voices she she now saw were coming from a huge crowd of young people. They were drinking. Jasmine saw they were packed in so tight they were going to be difficult to make her way through the throng. Jasmine just stood there on the bridge, a phone in one hand, a hand over a suitcase in the other, a classic pose of lost Taurus. She was a young woman with a black, super curly hair, and beyond her curls, a brown Dark brown eyes were shining with irritation. She descended into the alleyway and jumped, started pushing her way through the crowd. Hi, Jasmine said, begging somebody at random for the crowd and pre-offering pre- 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 her phone. I'm trying to find this address. Tristan screamed, was typical of a niece. It was just two lines, the area of the city, the building number. I don't know it, the young woman she has chosen, said with a shrug. I know it, said a a woman said, "Is there a boy? Come with me. I'll show you where it is." The alley that the young lady led her down was yet another one the phone app didn't recognise. So she just dropped it in a bag and forgot about it. 
she hurried her steps, hurrying to walk quickly to keep up with her guide. Jasmine followed her down alleyways, under arches, around turn after turn. But then the guide had gone. The moment she had been there, leading the way, the next Jasmine was on her own, a tiny dark alleyway. Halfway down the alleyway was a dark alleyway, gateway. It was a garden within that was obviously very overgrown. Even in darkness, the house was too dark and empty looking. It would be a building she was looking for. Her, 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 her accommodation, she decided. It could be the building she was looking for. Her accommodation, she decided. She pulled out her phone and opened the map's application. It showed her location as a red dot. Address she had been given was well, a blue dot. They were pretty much, but not exactly, on top of each other. It started to look like the creepy old building was the place she was supposed to stay the night. She cursed softly to herself and pushed her face against the rate on each swells of the metal gate so she could get a better look inside. She saw a big house with three stories. She saw there were windows and roof above, hinting at some kind of attic space. But the place was completely dark. The windows are a touch of North African in the complex arches and chimneys, the bulbous tops of the Middle Ages. The building looked ancient, half derelict, but so did all the other buildings. She cursed gently to herself as she gave the butt handle the gate an experimental nudge. She jerked back in shock as the gate came slowly open. And on screeching hinges, she even... More sure, this is the right place now, otherwise. Surely the gate would have been locked. She stepped through the gate, onto the short path that led across the garden to the front door. A suitcase still trundling noisily after her. She felt a wave of cold and neglect coming from the building. Just a huge crumbling pile of masonry, unloved and uncared for. She felt the damp radiating from the near ancient stones like the breath of a monster. She went up the small stone staircase to reach the front door. Her eye was immediately caught by a building, caught by a bull-headed door knocker. He reminded her of something she had been reading on the long train ride. She had been reading about Agoras, king of Athens, the goat man who gave his name to Agarin Sea. Agoras had engineered the death of the son of King Minos who declared war on Athens and had agreed to end the war if Africa would send seven young men and seven young women every nine years to Crete to feed the, to the Minotaur. She shuddered and reached to the knocker, but her hand froze halfway where she heard a click. The door swung wide o- on. Screaming hinges were obviously oiled just in, as frequently as the ones on the gate. Jasmine could see a calmness hallway with a lot high seeing and a high chandelier. It was almost enormous. It was also, it was also an enormous window opposite the front door, dominating the far wall. By the light of the big window, she could dimly see the envelopes of the wall, wallpaper, the ornate carving of the furniture, but also dark, big dark stains of mould and some chips and plaster. Toward the two doors led off from the massive hall. On either side of them, her uh, giant staircase led to the floors above. Jasmine took a step across the threshold. Hello, she yelled. Anyone home? No answer came. So Jasmine put her suitcase by the front door, walked further inside, yelling as she came. There was still no answer. And soon she was all the way across the hallway at a giant window. The view was magnificent. This house looked directly out into the canal. The waters were actually le- leapt at the face of the building, which explained why everything felt so cold and damp. She hadn't seen any sign of life yet. She guessed she would have to investigate the building a bit more to see where everyone's hiding. She rapidly turned from her very through the huge window, and then she screamed long and loud. There was a single figure standing right in front of her in the dark, silent room. She managed to pitch, pitch her lips together and force herself to stop screaming. It had just been a shock. She got to get hold of herself, the figure in front of her, wasn't a monstrous or an invitation, quite the opposite. It was a young woman, no taller than Jasmine herself, a slim, slight even. There was something about the way the moonlight, though, through the window, caught her face. 
There was a slimy, cold cast of the skin of the young woman in front of her. Or was it just raindrops reflected from the glass of the huge windows and made her face look weird? When, when had it started raining? Jasmine couldn't focus, couldn't bring the features of woman in sharp relief. No matter how much she squinted into the half-light, she could hear her own heart thumping hard in her ears. Time to take charge of the situation. She thought she opened her mouth to speak, but the young woman spoke first. There's a presence and anger in the voice. Jasmine felt that, even though she couldn't understand the girl's raging fast Italian. She called a word to, but the sense of but not the sense of it. She just stood slack jawed, her mouth hanging open, but her mind was racing. The voice was dark and husky, almost dry. Jasmine thought the young lady, woman looked like a rocker dressed in some sort of weird collection of dark vintage clothes. Shit, Jasmine hissed. The ugly word for involuntary is a fox scream had been. The effect was instant. The moment the woman heard a single word of English, she stopped at mid-sentence, her eyes narrowing suspiciously. You are English? I knew once an Englishman, she said, but didn't go on to elaborate. Shit, Jasmine hissed the end. Stuck her control of her own body, her own lips. Felt frightening. Who was this Englishman she was talking about? What has he some sort of was he some sort of some nutty expert who crossed her path? Or what he had done to her? Why was Jasmine going to have to pay the price for his misdeeds? She briefly considered barging past the girl and making a run to the front door. But some aura, like a nasty smell, was emulating for the girl, blocking off a wall escape. What brought you here? the girl asked. Jasmine had no idea what how to answer the question. She increasingly starting to suspect that this wasn't her accommodation. I'm not sure who, what brought me, Jasmine said, and emphasised the last two words, and felt strange, odd, fashioned in her mouth, but she thought again, thought how she had lost her guide, the one from one moment to the next. Blind chance, she said. Blind fate, the young woman corrected her. Jasmine had settled by the vehemence for which the young woman had just spoken. She wanted to get out of this creepy old mansion, but the girl looked up, that looked upset. It looked like she would have to try to calm her down, make sure she didn't feel the need to feel call the cops or something. My name is Jasmine. What's your name, Jasmine? Said falsely and smiled her face. I don't introduce myself to thieves or vagabonds or worse. Girl's eyes seemed to burn with indignation. Jasmine had heard of the expression, of course, but about eyes burning, but she'd never seen what almost looked like actual flames in someone's eyes before. What's in your, what's, is your purpose here? Yeah. Are you going to call the cops? I, Jasmine asked. I just arrived. I don't want to get in trouble with the police. You should have considered that provided my centrum. Come on, Jasmine applauded, drawing the word out of her ad emphasis. For the last time the girl barked. What do you want here? I just wanted a place to stay. My crazy old professor gave me a dress. This impossible find. I thought, I thought this address was this. The, the dress was this place. I'm sorry, you should have known it wasn't. It's a that red old building. The girl was visibly shaken by words. You think my house is strange? She asked. Does it look rotten to you? Not strange exactly, James Wren said. And certainly not rotten exactly. Jasmine felt awful about her clumsy words, overcome her now by pure embarrassment, an emotion strong enough to banish all fear. She was no longer frightened of the strange young woman, didn't care whether she called the police or not. She just wanted to make sure she didn't hurt the girl's feeling too badly. Go, the young woman said. Leave this place and go back to your goddamn lot. Got about, got about, got about life. Got about? Jasmine couldn't resist a snort of reason, a trace of words, although she knew it was rude. The girl's English was not was strange. Yes, the girl said, Cutabont, Hooligan, Rowdy. Someone to make does um, faultless and damaging things that only minus pleasure. I think the word fits you very well. Jasmine didn't take any couldn't take it any more. She dropped her head, pushed past the girl, and made the front door as she embarrassed and barrish trot. She's almost running all the time she reached the door. She, her face blushing red, but the door but at the door. She stopped, forced herself to try one last time. For some reason, she didn't leave 
couldn't leave this bizarre stranger with the idea she's some strange film seeker who spent her time breaking into rich people's houses for kids. Kicks. She turned. I'm not a good about. She said, "I don't know. Do I didn't. I don't do this." You did it tonight," the old woman said. "Yes," Jasmine admitted. "But I, I thought this place was decrepit." "No," Jasmine said. Oh, Jasmine, no, Jasmine almost grumbled with frustration. Oh, it's a place I'm supposed to stay. Accommodation, no. This is my home, the young woman said. With a flourish of hand, a gesture looked theatrical with a huge window behind her, making it a dark silhouette. I don't think anyone should live like this, Jasmine said, in the dark. Sometimes, the young woman said, it's unavoidable. Sometimes you just end up alone in the dark. Here, there's nothing to be done about it. Like I said, unavoidable. It's never uh, uh, unavoidable, Jasmine said. The smile she had forced into her face was still there. For though it was fading, she meant what she said. There was something Jasmine was convinced of. No matter how bad things got, you could always hang around on here, in here, in there, and wait for things to get better. Sitting in the dark, feeling sorry for herself, was absolutely not the answer. Let me at least turn on the lights. That will leave the darkness, the young woman said. But what about the loneliness? That's easy, Jasmine said, because in her experience it was. Making friends was just was the most natural thing in the world. She understood at all, at all how anyone could end up being lonely and alone. She smiled, walked a little way back across the low way, and raised her hand for the young lady woman to shake. Let's be friends. I don't make friends of every wandering lunatic breaks into my house in their movement, young woman said, and Jasmine was disappointed to see the mood hadn't softened one iota. Then something occurred to her. I didn't, but I didn't break in, Jasmine said. What do you mean, the young lady said, generally surprised. The door, the gate, wasn't locked, Jasmine said. I just pushed him open. As Don pulled, the girl stared at her. Some trick of light was catching her eyes. Picking out them like numerous discs of n- internal carnival, wolf perhaps, or panther. You just pushed them open, one girl, the girl said pensively. You say you brought here by by your faith in more science and two young women regarding each other. The stranger was still none at some way away across the hall, celebrated against a big window. If you, if you don't make friends with getabouts, Jasmine spoke silence and her words loud and confident. Who is it? Who do you make friends with? The girl hesitated to the answer. I make very few friends, she said. In my entire cursed existence on this earth, I even may have forgotten how to make friends. I find it, I find I have no earthly notion. Do you have a visiting card? Jasmine laughed out loud. She would be really beginning to enjoy this odd English woman's company. It's the old young, old young woman's company. Where had this learned to speak English? A grammar, a book, a dictionary from the previous century or something? Probably from the shelves of some moldy old library. She undoubtedly had hidden away in the house somewhere. No, she said, Colly, no visiting card. Just call me, tell me your name, and come over here and shake my hand. Jasmine still, still had her arm up, and she wiggled her head. Rightly, beckoning the young woman to shake. The young woman stared at her hand, shy as a deer. She wanted to come and shake hands. Jasmine could sense it, but she didn't feel secure enough. Come on, don't leave me hanging, Jasmine said. She'd been holding her hand out so long, her arm was getting tired. It was working. The girl was coming closer, slowly, timidly, one step at a time. Then the girl had closed half the distance between them. She stopped. Lifted her head proudly, put her hand, head to her breast, and immediately introduced herself. My name is Violetta Marquez Rosa Romanzia. Okay, mm, okay, Jasmine noted, smiled. Would it be all right if I call you Violetta? Yes, she said, and then after a pause, they would probably be best. I prefer if you not use my family name. Which of those, which was those was your family name? Jasmine meant it a joke. We could see by Violetta's raised elbow. She most judged it. Ignore me, she said. I've got a big mouth. She waggled her hand. 
and still hanging from waiting to be a hand trick. Violetta raised her hand, and Jasmine could swear she felt Violetta's hand approaching hers as she closed the final few steps that remained in between them. It was a wave of cold, like pins and needles, but mo- but made of darkness. My hand must be going to sleep, the thoughts she thought, as they touched. My God, Jasmine helped. Your hands are freezing. Violetta smiled sheepishly. It's a shame the temperature of her hands. She was standing in the shaft of the light now, and Jasmine got hot first good looks of her. Her dark hair was unkept, hunched on her head, of no particular style, and held a place of big silver pins. She was wearing any makeup from her. So her skin was pale. She was thin, almost gaunt, with a pair of piercing green eyes, staring out of slightly shallow sockets. The clothes were in an eccentric, rich, eccentric item from various upright knocks, half hidden by a dark, heavy cloak. Jasmine knew a thing or two about clothes, being a fan of various fashion blogs about fashion clothing. She could tell from the weight of the fabrics and detail the clothes were expensive when new, but also spotted in, in spurt patches and sewing. It was clear that Violetta was a little old bird which made Jasmine warm to her more. You, can, you can, cannot stay here, Violetta, said releasing Jasmine's hand. Show me the address you were given. Violet was showing Jasmine the way to the address, a sheet of paper, and across the large square. Again, it was very full of people. You know, Violetta, Jasmine, Jasmine said, I could use a drink, for the nurse, Violetta said, rising on her brow. Yes, exactly, Jasmine said, I did. Unless you'll be in a hurry to get back home. I have all night, Vanessa said. Most of these places still be closing soon. But there's a bar that is open later. Café Noir is nothing more than a disputable drinking den. Only a minute away, and Jasmine thought it was a cosy place, no matter what Violetta said about it. I suppose beams and brick and lemonade menus were expensive. Sensitive selection of snacks and drinks. It's not so bad, Jasmine said, glancing around, taking it all in. What do you? What is the way you have for looking orange drink that everyone is drinking? It's called a Spitz Apple Lowe, Brianna Violetta told her. It's sweet and it, means it gets strong here. If it burns, to get us each one, if you like. Very much, Jasmine said. I would like that very, very, would very much like a, what do you call it? It was much later before Jasmine was last in the, li- at, in the little apartment that had been rented for her. It was just one small room crammed with a small for a bed, a wardrobe, a kitchen, a washing machine, and there was always one. There was one tiny bedroom. It was just only big enough for her one person, but Jasmine made discover it was absolutely massive terrace. Terrace that was so big as the apartment itself. Well, she said, rushing out to the open air. This is your address, I'm afraid, Violetta said, as she followed her into the terrace. Tiny and dreadful, isn't it? Are you joking? Jasmine yelped. It's the best. This front looks out and tiny canal, and back has a terrace. It's wonderful. Wait here. Don't wait there. Jasmine rolled quickly, switched into the music app of her phone, and phoned in a scroll and a couple of glasses for the red wine. Violetta brought to the bar. Soon they were two half Full glasses, messing the wall of the terrace, along with the bottle and scoop, cook school, freshly liberated cork still impaled upon it. The first song on jazz playing playlist was coming from a phone in Miles, da- Miles Davis, a lonely trumpet, only just perceivable, coming softly from the phone's small speakers. Jasmine saw movement out of the corner of her eye, and they were closing the shutters of their apartment with Months windows. Then she noticed all the neighbouring windows shutters that were very were closed. Jasmine didn't understand it. But then Violet has cleaned. It's an Asian customer that closed shutters at night. You must plunge the home into tired darkness. Jasmine said, aghast. It seems almost medieval to me. It's me- it is medieval, of course, Violet has said. And took a sip of wine. Excellent, she said. Dances a tongue. Quite a discovery. Such an oldie bar. She was such a short silence, and then just the two young women, the wine and jazz, the invited against her, just mean, you're quite the night owl, she said. A lot of people would just go to bed. You're arriving in a strange city and having an adventure. I bet I'm a night, you bet I'm a night owl, Jasmine said. 
I think I'm going to like, uh, like having you as a friend, Violetta said. As those finally making a decision, the two young women clicked their glasses together. Two figures illuminated on the terrace, a tiny loft apartment above the among looming shadows. It's the only oasis of warmth and light amid the shattered windows and dark, deep darkness of the surrounding city. Just chapter 2. Despite her late night, Jasmine was up early. The sun had started to penetrate the bottom of Venice's, Venice's narrow alloys, but it was a pleasantly shaded and refracted version of sunlight. Jasmine shaded the screen of her phone. She made her way to her appointment at the university. Venice certainly was beautiful. Jasmine noticed as her eyes flickered from map on the phone to the streets around her and back. As she walked through the streets, she was puzzled and all, another side of what she was seeing. She was aware there was homelessness and begging in the streets, all mixed in with the halls of wealthy tourists and locals. She was extremely early, finding university much more quickly and much more easily than she expected. She decided to kill a few minutes in the calf, so as not to be embarrassing early. She seemed like there were three calves in every street, which made it difficult to choose one. But soon she picked one that appealed to her and cho- chose a table in the sun. When she ordered with the friendly Chinese lady, when she ordered with the friendly Chinese lady, Chinese lady who worked there, a table in the sun, checking an e- uh, email and reading the online version of British newspapers, she lost track of time, had to pay and leave in a rush. The university, when she reached it, was a huge structure of raw concrete. Had someone been hidden by its architect along the back streets and alleyways of Venice? Jasmine hastily navigated through its corridors. It was a few minutes late. By the time she found the office of the professor, she had sent to Venice to assist a woman named Professor Gamazon. Gamazon's office door was ajar, and as she was at a desk. Jasmine saw a face that was all hard angles. It had been chiseled and reading something on a laptop. Jasmine knocked on the door, popped her head into the room. He was seated by the desk. Jasmine could see the professor was tall and slim. Jasmine introduced herself. Was the general right? the professor asked. Not really, Jasmine replied. But it was my fault. I mixed my connection. Missed my connection. I didn't I didn't end up arriving to Venice until early midnight. The witch in our Jasmine murmured. I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay, Jasmine said. How did you like the part we arranged for you, Jasmine asked. It took some finding, Jasmine said, with an involuntary smile, and made once again remember the adventure the night before. But I made a friend, and they helped me locate it in, in the end. Anyway, I've been sent to assist you. What is it you would like me to do? I'm not sure. I can tell you, ju- you just yet, Jasmine replied. Oh, Jasmine said, a little non pos Just I've been sent halfway across Europe, just to assist you. I'm not sure how much help I can be if you don't tell me what I need to do. Well, I search is quite sensitive, Kazan Mom said. I need help. I need someone I can trust. I need someone with right qualifications. I was told you might have what I'm looking for. Jasmine, Jasmine Zone's voice trailed his look, Jasmine up and down pensively. Then she glanced at the screen on the laptop and then back at Jasmine. I guess it's stupid to have you come all this way and then get all precious about my search. It would be a waste of not having you to do anything, Jasmine said. I suppose I could start you with something tangible or to do my, to my studies and see how you do. Great, Jasmine said. It's just boring search, Jasmine Mulder. No field work. We, we, we all have to work our way up to that very slowly. For now, I need you to do some re- reading in the library for me. Okay, Jasmine said. What do you want me to read about? Ghosts, Kazmon said. Ghosts? Yes, Kazmon nodded. Like I said, I don't tell you too much. Can't tell you too much, but I'll tell you an important element of my search in relationship between ghost stories and society to boo. You enjoy it. That's lots of juicy stuff. What your teeth into? Sink your teeth into? Jasmine corrected, then cursed herself. Why was she correcting the most almost perfect English of a boss? Your boss. Really? Sink like a ship, huh? Jasmine's expression was suddenly ra- raising again. Praising again. She start- stared at Jasmine for a few seconds and pressed a button on the laptop's keyboard. 
There's a printer in the corner of the room and softly ghosted out of a sheet of paper. Okay, Kesman said. Get the list of books from here for a few hours. Pop them it pop in when you finish in the library. And tell me how how you they are settling in. Well do, Jasmine said. She awkwardly squeezed past Gansaman to get to the printer and despite not wanting to she glanced at the computer screen over Jasmine and Kevin's shoulder. There were two clock buttons open on the desktop. One's a list of books Gasman had just printed, the other was a f- some kind of report. At the top was a, her own name, and below were blocks of text and headings like skills, qualifications, character, and most strangely, more fibre. Gasman closed the document, and Jasmine immediately started to wonder if she had been, if she had been, de- right, re- if she read it right. It looked almost a bit like a resume, but she didn't think it was one she'd ever written. Library was just a few doors from Gabriel's office. Gabriel's office, but very strange shape. Both Gabriel's scubby hole and Kirby's library with some raw concrete walls. But the library was much bigger, much cold, much colder, and much more impersonal. It was more than this temple of learning with long wooden reading tables and small metal shelves. She glanced at this goes on the printed for her. Went over to some bookshelves relating oil history, dark privately printed books and Essays on folklore, a dark and musty box with incredulous on the clean, dusty, dust free beige metal shelving. She felt left her finger wandered down along the spine, looking for the first book on the list. She found it, a large format back with an ornate design on the vine. Her fingers wrapped around the old liver. She found the book, took over, took, t- took the book over to one of the cold tables that leads for it. There were fifty stories collected within, and numerous essays about them. That there was also three or four books on the list that Gazion had given it her. So there was no way she could be expected to read it. All day, she supposed she was to use her intuition and decide what what among all the material right would be useful to Gazion. Then she corrected herself. It was conceivable that Gazion was entirely familiar with these books. She'd probably been tested to read them as told to read them as a test. Gabriel was not what she expected at all. She'd been hoping to find a friend of a new boss, but instead a woman a cold and suspicious but had been cold and suspicious. Maybe she would fall, Jasmine decided. If she found some interesting new angle or two she was given to read something Gabriel hadn't considered before. The problem was that the book was nothing like she had ever read, as far as myth- methodology went. It was only a short note explaining that the ghost book was in the book, the way he's in the book, had been collected by an anthropologist from among the fishing communities of Venice Lagoon. It went as far from a definite writing as possible to text to be, and nothing to, for it, though. She leaned one head lowered one hand, hand to the door and started con- concentrating. One of the books caught her eye and she started reading. The book told of an old fishing boat operated by three fishermen. Joining them first time in the night was a young lad. Fishermen took the boat very far out the goon and carried out fishing long into the night. The first time the young lad had been out fishing so late. The three older men noticed he was in ease and frightened. A rough old man found this hilarious. Still, they hadn't needed to get over to his severe and work, so there might be a bright, bright lantern at the front and back of the boat. Look, it's almost as bright as day, one of them said to the boy. The young man didn't, hadn't, hadn't re, was reassured. He went and joined the men at the, at the side of the boat. Heaven, we reached out and helped them throw the nets in the water. They could see its hands were shaking. They try and calm him. One of the men mentioned the horizon, where the lights of the city of Venice could be seen in the distance. Look, they said, you can see the lights of the city. One of them is your bedroom window. We can't be very far from home, can we? Again, the boy wasn't very sure. He didn't stop shaking. He did stop shaking enough to help the others throw out the nets. And the night drew well on, and the boys began to relax a little. The chill and the dust lifted over the sun had gone down. The long night itself wasn't as really as cold as but stories of old men were funny and the lads started to cheer up. Now again the fishermen took a small nip of some of a bottle with some fiery lemonade water drink they brought with them. Just a bit, one old man said. He passed the drink. A little bit will keep you awake. You can't 
drink too much until we reach the our, our little liner and be safe for the night. We're not going straight to Venice, the boy asked. No, lad, we're too far out. We spend the night in our hut and head back at the first light. I mean, we life after that, depending on the catch. The shadows of the lagoon and vast of wooden fences sunk in the mud. The trap fish and stand and was good fishing, even when the tide was low. Each maze of fencing an island at the centre, and each island was a little hut built of cane and plaster of mud. Huts with nothing more than one square room, a door and two windows. Each isolated hut with any structure visible from night elves around, except for Venice itself, way off in the distance. In one of the little structures that fishermen tend to spend the night, but first they had to haul the nets. The coaches were huge back in those days. It was needed all them working as a team to get nets into a boat. They all fall and reached the freezing water together. Got a, got a good hold of the nets together and all hold at once, smoke, spinning fish into the deck. A boat with one heave sang traditional songs to keep the pace. It was warm work, even when freezing water splashing about their ears. <laughs>